Well, good afternoon. It's Monday, it's three o'clock, it's the 25th of January. It's a little bit snowy here in Edinburgh and very, very cold, but it's a special day. It is Burns Day, it's Burns Night. Tonight, Scotland and the Scottish diaspora all around the world will be celebrating the poetry of the National Bard. So we're going to talk a wee bit more about Robert Burns, give you a bit more context about him and about his life, so that you too can share and a little bit of Burns tonight. Now, first thing I'm going to show you is a photograph that's very well known, or a picture, a painting um, that I've printed off. And this is the famous Robert Burns, a very, very handsome man. There we go. Now, he's the Scots National Bard, the Bard being our national poet. He celebrated, we celebrate his birthday every year and we celebrate it in a particular style, which I'll go into a little bit later on. But I want to talk more about the life and the history and the influences and who he influenced throughout his history as well. He had a very short life, a very short life indeed. Um, he was born in 1759 in Alloway in Ayrshire, which is over in the southwest of Scotland. And he died at the end of the 1790s as well, 1796. It's a very, very short life, but what a life he had. And I'm going to talk about the various stages of his life and what led to his fame and why he became famous, not only in Scotland, but around the world. Because always what surprised me is I've been to quite a few places around the world. I've been to New Zealand, I've been to the States, uh, Canada, and lots of other places. And in all these places, there are statues in various cities dedicated to Robert Burns. So let's talk a wee bit more about him. So he grew up in Alloway in Ayrshire. He was the son of a farmer, and that was his first occupation, was his working with his father from the age of 12. He was engaged in farm work from about the age of 12 to the age of 15. By the age of 15, he was indeed the main labourer in the farm. It was more of a subsistence farming, but his father did believe in education, as he did in most Scots families. So he did hire a student to educate not only Burns himself, but to also to educate his other son, Gilbert. So a student came in. So Robert Burns was educated quite a high level, even before he went to school. And this is a bit of the emphasis that we have, and it goes back to the emphasis that we have here in Scotland as to education. Many, many people have written about Burns, and there's so many quotations about him. The ones that I like are saying that he was a ploughman poet, or he was the heaven-taught ploughman. There's so many accolades that he's had throughout, the, throughout the, his life. One of his very, very early poems was written because it was in the fields. And one of the most famous ones, I would have hasten to add as well, was an ode to a mouse. He was out helping his father in the field with a scythe and chopping down the hay, the corn, um, or the wheat, to make their, their sustenance over the winter. And he did see that he'd actually taken down a little house belonging to this mouse. And this affected him a lot. Um, he was in tune with nature quite a lot. I mean, he's probably one of the first eco-warriors you could come across. And he decided to pen a little poem. And the first one I'm going to read to you, a little bit of it, is Ode to a Mouse. Now, hopefully, you'll, you'll recognise some of the lines here that I'm going to, as well, that I'm going to mention. You might recognise them, how other people have picked them up. But it starts off with, We sleek at Curran Timorous Beastie, Oh, what panics in thy breastie, Thou needna start away so hasty with bickering brattle. I would laith to run and chase thee with a murdering paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle. At thee, thy poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. So you can see that he's actually using Scots and he's using English, and this is what he was very good at. He was very good at mixing the Scots language with the English language to give it flavour. He was educated in the local language that he grew up with, and Mike and I, we grew up speaking Scots as well, and I don't know about Mike, but in school we were not allowed to speak Scots. Yeah. We yeah. had to speak That's English. Right. When you were in the playground, you spoke Scots. So you almost grew up bilingual with these languages. But it goes on, it's like three or four different little chapters, but the one I want to finish off with in terms of Ode to a Mouse is this verse that says, But Mousy, thou art no, la no thy lane, 
Improving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang aft ugly. And Lee is not but grief and pain for promised joy. Now there's a line in there. The best laid plans of mice and men. And if you know your Steinbeck, you will know of mice and men. And his final little stanza is, Still thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee, but och I backwards cast my e on prospects drear, and forward though I can he see, I guess in fear. So he's basically saying that he's in tune with what he's doing to the little animal there, and he knows that the animal's a little blessed because it hasn't got the foresight to be scared. It just goes on and does what it wants, whereas in man's dominion, this is men taking over, man taking over nature, and he's already saying there are things we should be scared of. It's a lovely little poem, and this is, uh, this is part of his first edition, it was called the Kilmarnock edition. And when he wrote this edition, he did write and say that the poems were going to be written in the Scots dialect. Now some people would say, is it a dialect or is it a language? Scots was spoken widely through courts up until the 1600s with the Act of Union, when, not the Act, sorry, the Act of Union was in 1707, but when King James VI of Scotland became James I of England, he moved his entourage, royal entourage, down to London. And then English became more of the lingua franca of the country. And to some extent, to some extent, Scots took second place. But he's helped push it forward. He's using the language that other poets had used. He was influenced by the poet, Edinburgh poet Robert Ferguson and Alan Ramsay, both wrote and spoke in the Scots vernacular. He's picking up and making it popular and it's part of his pride in his nation. Moving on from the farmer side, um, another great aspect that people talk about when they're talking about Robert Burns is his uh, sexual proclivities, shall we say. He was one for the lassies. He was well known for putting it about, shall we say. And there's a few poems, love poems, that he wrote to some of the women in his life. Now we do know that at least, at least we know of that he had 12 children to at least five women that we know of. Some legitimate, some are illegitimate. So he's got a pretty, pretty uh, shady history in terms of his relationship with the women. I'm going to mention a few of them as we go along here. The first fell in trouble with a little serving way, uh, I was going to say serving wench, she was a, a maid, a housemaid, and I believe she was a housemaid actually to the Burns family, and he got her pregnant. Now this caused, as you can imagine, Kate, I mean, the Church of Scotland was f fully against this. They stood in, the, in their churches and they called him a fornicator. But he didn't have much time for the hypocrisy of the church, or the hypocrisy of the classes above him. In fact, he actually challenged them and he wrote a poem to his first daughter who was illegitimate. And the poem was actually um, written to his daughter and it was called A Poet's Welcome to His Love Begotten Daughter. So the church people were calling him a fornicator, a whoremaster. But he fought against them and he cried against what the, the, the gossips of the church and the kirk and had been called by somebody up in a pulpit names. And you see this through his poetry a lot, because I'm going to talk a wee bit more about the rebel side of, of uh, Burns as well. But his second lover that we get to, mention, get to know of is Jean Armour. He eventually married Jean Armour, but again, Jean got pregnant before they got married. And Jean's father did not want her to marry Robert Burns. Robert Burns had to sign over everything that he had, and this is just before he published his Kilmarnock edition. He signed everything off because he knew that people were going to come for him as well. So he went on a bit of a run. While he was on the run, moving around, sleeping in places, he also went out with another girl called Highland Mary. Now, we don't know an awful lot about Highland Mary, but he was actually planning to leave with Mary to go to the West Indies. The West Indies was a place where people did run off to in those days to work in slave plantations. So he kind of figured he's got to get out there. But during that period, they picked up his Kilmarnock edition and it got published and he became well-known. Critics in Edinburgh were praising this peasant lad from the southwest of Scotland, saying he was a literary genius. And this is where it all takes off. 
So we've got his first girl, his first woman is mentioned, Elizabeth Patton, she was a servant girl. Second one, Jean Armour, who he eventually married, and Jean had a hell of a life with him, because she actually took on other children he had sired along the way. And then, Highland Mary, and Highland Mary, as I said, they were going to walk, run away together to the West Indies, but she died. And so he was left alone, and he did po write a few poems to Highland Mary. Then he comes over to Edinburgh and he's fated in Edinburgh. He is sitting in the best salons in the city. He's holding court. He's meeting people. People come into him. People are paying money for poetry. He's meeting the upper echelons and he's also meeting the lower echelons. And one of the people he meets is Agnes McElhose. Now, Agnes McElhose was a married woman and he was having an affair with this married woman. Although she was estranged from him, her husband was actually living in the West Indies. But she did not want the word to get out they were actually having this affair. So they had adopted some pen names. She was to be known as Clorinda and he was known as Sylvander. And they would write pen love, love letters to each other. Now he did love McElhose or Agnes. They also refers to her as Nancy in one of the poems. And it's when they actually separated, she decided that she was going to go and visit, stay with her estranged husband in the West Indies. And they left and he penned the famous one, A Fond Kiss. And I'll read a wee bit that to you as well. But to show how democratic he was in his favours with the women, while he was having an affair with Agnes McElhose, the upstairs and, and you know the upper echelons, he was also having a dalliance with his with her maid. And his maid was Jenny Clow. And Jenny Clow bore him a son. So why so he, he as I mentioned he was democratic. He was liberal. He 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 didn't he was out with the upper echelons and he was downstairs with the, with the servants. He didn't really care where he was putting it about. The fifth one we know a lot about is Anne Park. And Anne Park was another lover of his and she delivered him a daughter. And this daughter was then adopted by Jean Armour. As I said, Jean had a hell of a time with him and his dalliances and he and was birthing, giving birth to, uh, or siring children all over. Now the wee song, Aphon Kiss, is probably one of his famous love songs and he's very, very famous for his love poetry as well. And it's as they're leaving, um, she's gone off to the West Indies, and he writes, A for kiss, and then we sever. A farewell, and then forever. Deep in heart-wrung tears I pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. And I'll jump on a wee bit. Because I'll ne'er blame, blame my partial fancy. Nothing could resist my Nancy. But to see her was to love her. Love but her, and love forever. And he finishes again with the repeat of the first one. A phone kiss and then we sever. A farewell alas forever. Deep in heart wrung tears I pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I wage thee. Probably one of the most famous love songs that he wrote. And if you listen to it, you'll see it. It's absolutely beautiful when it's sung. Now so many different singers have picked this up and run with it. It's a great poem to, to sit and read. Again, you can see the mixture of using English in this term. So he will flip between English and Scots. So that's touched on the lover part of him, the part of that Edinburgh loved him, the ladies loved him, and he loved them in return as well. The next stage I want to take you on to is the part of the patriot and the rebel. Because I mentioned before that he didn't have high regard of people above him. He sums up this love affair that we have here in Scotland. We are what we call, we have a healthy disregard for authority, and that's us. And he had it in spades. He would decry the leaders of the church. He hated hypocrites. He hated lords and ladies. He just didn't like people being above him. He didn't give them much regard. And he would use his poetry to show that. He was also very patriotic. He wrote very patriotic songs about Bruce and Wallace and national heroes. He wrote rebel songs. You have to remember, in the end of the 1700s, there was a lot of revolutionary politics going on throughout Europe and in North America. The American War of Independence had taken place. France was in tumult. They were having the revolution there. He was very well aware of the teachings that were coming out from Edinburgh and from all around as well about liberty and for all. And he would write about this. One of his favourite songs that he, he wrote was Scots Wahey. And this is a very, very nationalistic song. And it's all the song about Bruce and Wallace. And it's a song about the Battle of Bannockburn. 
I'm actually from Bannockburn, so we grew up, <laughs> we grew up, this was like our mother's milk to us with this song here. And uh, it goes, Scots where he with Wallace bled, Scots when Bruce has often led, welcome to your gory bed or to victory. Well now's the day and now's the hour, see the front of battle lower, see approach proud Edward's power, it's only chains and slavery. And then he goes on about Scots being traitors and you couldn't be a traitor in those days. But then he said at the very end, and this is where he goes on about liberty. Lay the proud usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every blow, let us do or die. So you always get this image of liberty and freedom. Now he travelled around Scotland and he saw what was happening up in the highlands of Scotland because he was also living in the aftermath of the Battle of Culloden. He saw how the Highlanders were being treated and he penned poems to defend the Highlanders, to write about the Highlanders. Now he was a Presbyterian Protestant from the Lowlands, but he saw injustice and he wrote about injustice. He actually joined the militia in Dumfries and he kind of joined it with a, he was a bit two-faced about this. He joined it because radicals were being arrested and he didn't want to be arrested. But when he wrote a poem to the Dumfries militia, he finished the lines with, and while we sing God save the king, never forget the people. So he always had this ability to level people down. We have this expression that we used to, like my father used to use it a lot. It's like, even the Queen of England has to drop her drawers to go to the toilet. So nobody should be above you, nobody's below you. We're all exactly the same. Now, some of the songs that you remember that we all sing at New Year in English-speaking world, at least, would be all Lang Syne. And we are going to give you a couple of tunes later on as well, so we'll get them ready for you. I hope you can join us in Old Lang Syne. But tonight, tonight is when we sit and have our Burns Supper. Now, what is a Burns Supper? Well, it's very ritualised. And there's certain things you have to have, and I've got a little bag of good stuff in here to show you. There are a few essentials that you're going to need for your burnt supper tonight. The first thing you're going to need is your book of Burns poetry. Always keep it handy and give other people a chance. Have a chance of reading it in Scots and English. It can be a real hoot when you hear people try to read something in the Scots language if they're not familiar with it. So I've got a little pocket version here. There we go. So always keep a little bit of whiskey handy because there's lots of whiskey getting drunk today. There's a little single malt from Campbellton there. Campbellton Lock, I wish you were whiskey. That's a good one, that's Spring Bank, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spring Bank from Campbellton. Yeah. And of course, you cannot have it without your haggis. Are you having haggis tonight, Joe? Yeah, definitely, I'm having this one. So yeah, we're having it tonight as well. Yeah. It smells delicious. People often say, oh, what's inside a haggis? I'll say it's full of delicious things. Yeah. Now, this one's made of lamb, but you can get them made of um, venison. You can have halal haggis. You can have vegetarian haggis. You can have kosher haggis. Indeed, many years ago, I was friends with some Scottish uh, Jews at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, they invited me to the Jewish Society, and they had kosher haggis. Of course, they didn't call it Rabbi Burns Night. They called it Rabbi Burns Night, just as a bit of a joke there. And so he did write the poem to the haggis. Now, he was making kind of fun in many regards about the food and the drink in Scotland, but it was also a response to Dr. Samuel Johnson, because Dr. Samuel Johnson, when he went on his tour of Scotland, didn't have much to say good at the beginning um, of his tours. He did become a convert at the end, but he was going around and he was writing about the poor food that people were eating here. Burns turned that on his head and he made a poem to the haggis and it was called Ode to a Haggis. And you must, must do this, the same, because what happens is in the ritual, the haggis is the star of the show and they pipe the haggis in. The haggis gets piped in and we do the address to the haggis. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'll give you a couple of stanzas here. And it says, Fair for your honest sonsy face. Sonsy just means comely, lovely. Great chieftain of the pudding race, I boon them all you attack your place, pinch, tripe or therm. Well, uh, well are you worthy of a grace as long as my arm. And it goes on about how delicious it is. And then the chef or the person who's given the, the address of the haggis will get all excited about this and it builds and builds and they actually, actually start pulling it apart. Haggis then becomes the food of Scotland. 
And he says, but mark the rustic haggis fed. The trembling earth resounds his tread. Clap his wally neva blades, he'll make it whistle. And legs and arms and heads will sned like the thraps of thistle. And at the very end, he says, your powers will make mankind your care and dish them out their bill of fare. Old Scotland wants no skinking wear. Skinking wear is thin soup that jopes in luggies. And if you wish her grateful prayer, give her a haggis. So ladies and gentlemen, we're here in Edinburgh. We're under the Burns Monument here, which is erected uh, by the architect Thomas Hamilton. And uh, this is a replica of the Burns Monument in Alloway in Dumfrieshire. And uh, when you come to Scotland, I would highly recommend that if you're interested in the Burns poetry and you're in the west of Scotland, to go and visit the Burns Visit Visitor Centre. It's a gorgeous place and there's so much history involved in this poetry. And it's been a pleasure to bring you here on the 25th of January to celebrate Robert Burns' birthday. Happy birthday, Rabbi. Mike is here, and he's got the picture of Robert Burns. And uh, we've got Linda and Magnus on the accordion. So we're going to give you a little set. Mike is also going to give you a set on his bagpipes as Bike well. Pipes, yeah. Okay, so uh, welcome. And here we go with the musicians. And if you look at the background, I'll give you a spin around in the background. We've got the Royal High School here. Okay. The old Royal High School. I'll get the music. Here we go. Right, we've got really Nelson's very Monument. Sunny here. So that's Buildings looking I'm great in the sunshine. The so we've got a few Scottish songs there. I mentioned a man's a man for all that. Scots were hey and old line zine. And we'll take in some of the beautiful scenery as we go around. So take it away, musicians. Well done. Thank you. Well done, Magnus. Well done, Linda. Take a bow. So Mike is going to give us a few tunes on the bagpipes. And we have to stand over here so people can walk past safely. But in the sunshine.
Yes, well done. Oh, we've got a little bit. We've got an audience. <laughs> Just, we've gathered an audience. Off. So we're going to finish off with Old Lang Syne. We've got a gathered a little audience here. <laughs> Well done. So happy Burns Night to everybody and happy Burns Night to the audience as well. Hope you all have a happy Burns Night. You're broadcasting live to across the world to so say hello to the world. <laughs> so great big thanks for Mike and Joe here for our virtual tours. We're so glad you can join us every Monday at 3 p.m. UK time. Um, Please tune in and again I want to say a big thank you to all of you who find it in your hearts to give us some contributions. We really appreciate that. So I'm going to say maybe Mike can pick up his microphone. So you can hear Mike as well. So it's thank you from me. Uh, thank you from me and uh, thanks for joining. Happy Burns Night and uh, maybe you'll be breaking into the malt whiskey tonight. Maybe not, but whatever you're doing tonight, stay safe and see you next Monday. And enjoy your poetry and enjoy your haggis if you're having a haggis. <laughs> Bye for now. All the best. Slanche. Slanche.